My name is Rasha Drashkovich. I'm a television producer in Los Angeles. I was born and raised in the U.S. And I remember growing up, the name Draja Mihailovich always produced a strong reaction. He was a hero in World War II, being the first to rise up against Hitler in occupied Europe. A Hollywood movie and a radio program starring Orson Welles praised his struggles. A recently found archival film of his Yugoslav army, popularly known as the Chetniks, showed them rescuing over 500 U.S. airmen behind enemy lines. But something turned after the war. He was no longer referred to as a hero, but as a villain, and worse yet, a traitor. Our film is an attempt to show you how the media influenced popular opinion, both for and against Mihailovich. It's an examination of a man who was caught in the crossfire of history, so powerful that the mere mention of his name today provokes emotion. This is the Ravnagora Plateau in western Serbia. The history of this mountainous region is one of struggles against invaders. Not far from here, the Serbian army won the first big battle for the Allies in World War I. But in 1941, Serbia was part of Yugoslavia, which was overrun by the German army. Refusing to surrender, Colonel Mihailovic came here in May with 26 men, soldiers from the Yugoslav army who would soon become the largest resistance force in Europe. When the war started, for example, the Ravnu Goru, who was not killed, Draža Mihailović, who did not allow the whole army to be killed and to be killed by the whole Serbia, the heart of Serbia, the Ravnu Goru, the Lobor and Jelic. He simply, when he heard that he was killed, he said, I will not be killed by the Germans. Officers of the Yugoslav army, who refused to surrender to the Germans, learn that Mihailovic is in Ravna Gora and make contact with him. He will lead them in the next four years, waging a guerrilla war against the Axis. Mihailovic will launch attacks on German communication lines he will infiltrate his agents into German collaborationist ranks. By 1942, he will raise the largest Allied army between London and Cairo. Mihailovich assigns Army Major Jarko Todorovic to organize an underground resistance and gather intelligence in the capital city of Serbia and Yugoslavia. Todorovic forms the Belgrade Command and recruits students from the Democratic Party. We were very little communicated between us. We had several groups. One is Desimir Tošić, who was the leader of the Beograd. Marko Krstić je bio odgovarao za drugi deo Beograda. Kad je uopšen Desimir Tošić, oni su samo uhapcili još četvoricu koji su radili sa njim, a nisu znali za ostale koji su učestvovali u organizaciji demokratske stranke. This is pre-war footage of King Peter with Yugoslav army officers. Once in the hills with Mihailovic, they will come to be known as Chetniks. Their clean-cut image will change dramatically. Many will don peasant clothing as their uniforms wear out. They will grow beards in keeping with the Serbian guerrilla tradition, but they will formally continue to be officers of the Yugoslav army.
on je zadržao sve elemente funkcionisanja predratne vojske i prosto prema važećem pravilu službe i ratnom planu on je sebe smatrao kao jedan izdanak te vojske koji funkcioniše u gerijskim uslovima. Naziv je Jugoslovenska vojska i suština je u tome da se on nije menjao posle 6. aprila 1941. Suština je u tome da postoji kontinuitet i vojske i države i monarhije sve do 1945. godine. When the Yugoslav government uh, went into exile, when it first arrived in, in London, uh, they were treated as heroes because they had opposed the Axis. You know, they had fomented a coup d'etat, they were seen as brave allies. In April of 1941, the Germans have one goal, to capture the 18-year-old King Peter. He evacuates to London and joins other exiled leaders, amongst them General Charles de Gaulle of France and General Vladislav Sikorsky of Poland. My people are being tested as they've never been tested before. They are resisting heroically under their gallant leader, Draja Mihailovic. He was the first person to, as it were, uh, show any sign of resistance within occupied uh, Europe to Hitler. I mean, there'd been all that catalogue of German victories, and suddenly there was this little chap. With Benson Price as our master of ceremonies, David Brookman and the Treasury Orchestra and Chorus, and starring Mr. Orson Welles in Violet Atkins' story of unconquered Yugoslavia, the Chetniks. Termin Četnik ima dakle dugu istorijsku tradiciju. To je termin koji je vezan za istorijski kontekst borbe srpskog naroda za oslobođenje. The Četniks. In a gloomy forest back in the hills of Yugoslavia, a group of men stand in a half circle around their leader. On je posle prvog svjetskog rata ušao u zvaničnu vojnu terminologiju kao izraz aktivnosti na onom prostoru koji je za posljednu neprijateljske okupatorske snage. I imali su četinske jedinice koje su bile udarne jedinice u našoj vojsci i imali su od ove specijalne uniforme. To su bile jedinice za specijalne namene. Oni su preformirali nego što su komandos i britanski formirali nešto. To su jedinice koje su nastale kao potreba za vođenje specijalnih operacija u pozadini neke. Before the outbreak of the war, general Charles de Gaulle argued against the Maginot Line, a series of fortifications and tank obstacles as the French army's plan to stop the pending German attack. He was proven right. Germans overran France in a matter of weeks. Mihailovic faced the same situation in Yugoslavia. He criticized the Yugoslav version of the Maginot Line. He did a referat and he put it ministarstvu vojske, a Milan Nedić je bio ministar vojske. I Milan Nedić njega osudi zbog toga na kućni zatvor. Nedić blokao Mihailović's promotion to rank of general in 1939, arguing that his guerrilla strategy undermines the Yugoslav Maginot defense against the Germans. In 1941, General Nedić will witness the failure of his Maginot concept. Došli smo u jednu vrlo zamršenu situaciju u kojoj su dva srpska oficira izabrala dva različita puta. General Nedić saradnje sa Nemcima, pri čemu je i on bio svestan da na kraju rata Nemci neće biti pobjednici i da će njemu biti suđeno. General Nedić, like Marshal Patan in France, decides to yield to the Germans. On August 31st, 1941, he forms the Serbian government of national salvation, recognizing German authority. In Yugoslavia, there was another movement, especially at the moment of the attack on the Soviet Union koji je podržan sa istog. They are the members of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, headed by Josip Broz, known as Tito. The Communist Party of Yugoslavia 
organizes a guerrilla force, the Partisans. Mihailovich and Tito establish telephone communication to coordinate action against the Germans. Treba shvatiti jednu stvar. Uh, pokret Draža Mihajlovića je uglavnom bio vođen kod oficira. Tek sam izašao iz Jugoslovenske vojske i među ti 20 mi smo udarili na rudnik na, da oslobodimo kad su pošli Nemci onaj, iz Topole prema Kragujevcu i tuna, tuna nam je jedan uh, ranjen uh, manem rukom kroz usta i jedan nam je uh, poginuo i od, od 18 nas smo, vratili smo se onda i onda smo onaj, uh, po, zarobili smo nekoliko onaj, uh, oružje, dobili smo oružje i onda smo postala četa pa poslije postala bataljon i od bataljona postali su korpuši. Mihailovic's men, commanded by the youngest lieutenant colonel in the Yugoslav army, Veselin Masita, take the town of Loznica from the Germans. Masita dies while charging German lines, but the first town in occupied Europe is liberated. Five towns liberated, four more under siege in the fall offensive of 1941. Mihailović issues an order which regulates postal service in liberated Yugoslav towns. Na Čunjićima smo zajedno vodili borbu kad smo ubili devet vojnika i tri oficira. Opredelenje je bilo sad je ko će da ide na jednu stranu, ko će na drugu. Ja sam se opredelio za moju za, zahletu i otišao sam, a mnogi su se opredelili tamo i posle su prišli mene, ima četvorica koji su prišli meni, na primjer, bacili petokrak, a postavili onaj krunu. Tito je tada bio u stvari u neku ruku podređen, jer on je dolazio kod Draža u štab da pregovara, a ne Draža kod njega. I onda je, kad su se vraćali, jedan od komandanata je rekao Draži im, Suše, bit ćemo da, kad on je odmoro da je da ih, da ih likvidiramo. A Draža je rekao, ja sam dao reč. I ako je neko od njih pokuša nešto da ih, da ih napadne, on će biti streljan. To treba s vama da bude jasno. I nije dozvolio da se mašta desiti tu dok se vratio svoj kraj gdje je bio kolom To Tito ne bi učinio sa dražom. Kad je Wilhelm Njemački car na onom telegramu da je kapitulirala Bugarska napisao zar 62.000 Srba da reši sudbinu rata. Sramota. On koji imao armiju od 2,5 miliona vojnika gubi rat zbog onih srpskih vojnika na Solunskom frontu. E takvu ulogu je mogla ovaj balkansko ratište da odigli u drugom svjetskom ratu. Nažalost, podeljeno su samo i zemlji, doveli su do toga da se iscrpljujemo u međusobnom ovaj, ratovanju, da većina gubitaka koje smo imali su u bratu, ubilačkom ratu, u građanskom ratu koji je bio i među nas sami, a da je to omogućilo ovaj, okupatoru relativno stabilan sistem okupacije, da iscrpljuje što je moguće više prirodne resurse iz ove ovaj, zemlje i da, nango, i da ne angažuje svoje prvorazredne te elitne jedinice koje su mu bile potrebne za druge frontove. Stalin supported Mihailović and actually reprimanded Tito and said, you don't want to be making social revolutions. What you need to be doing is joining forces with the other resistance movement and fighting against the Axis. It's a long way to Tripperary. It's a long way to go. But it was not until about the September of 1941 that the first mission, which is to, with a chap called Bill Hudson, a South African, got through to Mihailovic. Hudson's brief was to go into occupied Yugoslavia, 
find out who is resisting, report back on who is resisting and support them in any way they could. On the eve of the war, Prime Minister Winston Churchill created a special operations agency whose mission was to encourage sabotage and resistance in occupied Europe. The policy of the SOE was that these various places in occupied Europe would have their secret armies, which would be lying low. And this was why the British army, in, certainly in 1941 and early 1942, were in favour of Mihailovic lying low and not risking. The towns taken by his men and the partisans in the fall offensive were reclaimed by the Germans, who now want revenge. On September 23, 1941, the German authorities introduce a new policy. For every dead German soldier, 100 Serbs are to be executed. For every wounded German soldier, 50 Serbs will be killed. Bill Hudson, who is the first SOE officer um, to, to arrive in uh, occupied Yugoslavia, arrived shortly after this happened. And um, he described it very movingly in a BBC interview some years ago, in which he said that every morning and every evening, um, the women of the town would be out in the fields, uh, wailing and keening. Um, I'm terribly sorry, that's, <laughs> that's an, caught me unawares. But m morning, they were, they were mourning every night and every evening. And he said it was a terrible, a terrible sort of atmosphere. And it affected Mihailovic very badly. And from that moment on, Mihailovic felt that he should act as a shield for the people um, and protect the people. Prema the German reports, from 1942, to the Ustan, there were 49,750 Serbs, civil and za svega nekoliko meseci trajanja tog ustanka zaista drastične žrtve. Mada je bilo odmazdi bilo ubijanja, ali tako sistematsko i tako, tako svedeno na matematički izraz, mislim da je bilo samo na prostoru okupirane Srbije. In an effort to stop the reprisals, Mihailovic offers to meet with the representatives of the German army. He arrives to the meeting accompanied by his assistant, Major Alexander Mišić. The German army is recognized as such by the entire world. How can it be wrong when men fight for their country? Oh, it's quite simple. We have the right to execute every guerrilla we capture. As well as the right to starve defenseless women and children? It's no use discussing human decencies with them, Georgia. Give them the ultimatum and let's get out of here. Bahailovich is faced with a demand for unconditional surrender. He refuses and immediately notifies London. However, he asks the Germans to give him time to contact his commanders and relay the offer to them, aware that the German army is actually preparing for an assault. Three weeks after the meeting, the Germans launch Operation codenamed Mihailovic. They print a wanted poster with a reward for Mihailovic's head of 200,000 dinars. The Germans carry out a parallel offensive against the partisans, codenamed Užice and pushed them to the area controlled by the independent state of Croatia, formed in the western part of Yugoslavia with the help of the Axis. Recimo, Aleksandar Mišić, kod koga je Draža otišao na Ravnu Goru, Draža je otišao u kuću Vojvode Živojna Mišića, a ne na Ravnu Goru, zato što je ona posebno važna. The Germans surround Mihailovic's headquarters in a house in the village of Struganik. A man comes out, surrenders, and introduces himself as Dragoljub Mihailovic. But this man was in Draža. The man pretending to be Draža was Major Alexander Mišić, 
Mihailovich's assistant and the son of General Misic. The Germans take Misic to prison camp, convinced they have captured Mihailovich. Major Misic's sacrifice allows Mihailovich to escape unnoticed. Americanci su jugoslovensku vladu u izbjeglištu samo kralja Petra koji je ugošćen na najvišem mogućem nivou u Americi i generala Mihilovića njegov pokret smatrali savezničkim pokretom. King Peter, boy ruler of Yugoslavia, meet President Roosevelt for the first time. Only 19, the young king comes to seek aid for Yugoslav guerrillas waging war against the Axis. Mihailovic not only survives the December offensive, but comes out stronger, raising a massive army in the spring of 1942. A system of radio stations is established, which allows him to command troops across Yugoslavia. He is promoted to the rank of general and appointed as the chief of staff of the Yugoslav army by King Peter and the Yugoslav government. It was at the behest of the British that the Yugoslav government in exile appointed Mihailovic as their Minister of War. And the British gradually began to see Mihailovic as the most important element, much more important than the exiled government. In 1942, Mihailovic emerges as the hero of the European resistance. However, the reality on the ground is different. His army has insufficient weapons for serious offensive action. Hudson and then subsequently Bailey sent out desperate messages saying, send us arms. If, if you can send enough arms, Mihailovic can raise thousands of people, but you need the arms to, to supply them for resistance and also uh, to show them that we're serious, to demonstrate to Mihailovic that we really mean that we want to support him. I know that there were commitments made by Roosevelt at the time. I felt as though events subsequent to that sort of overran those uh, commitments. Um, it was largely symbolic. We weren't in a position at the time to follow up much in the way of material support to the resistance. In fact, it will be some time before we can do that. Mihailovic has to avoid action against the Germans because of reprisals. He has no weapons coming from the British. It is time he uses his pre-war nemesis, Nadich. He also encouraged some of them to join the, uh, the Nedich uh, State Guard in, in Belgrade. Zato što je to jedini način da on pribavi ne samo oružje nego i informacije. He was very, very careful and very adamant when he was instructing his own people to do this that they should always bear in mind that they were his people, not Nedić Chetniks, and that when he gave the signal, they were to desert Nedić and come to him. Uh, in time for the general rising. Još jedan izvor oružja, a to je bilo više 42. godine, je bio od strane srpske državne straže. Koji su koji su naši po, ljudi iz pokta Daže Mihale uspeli da probiju. E sada ostaje da se konkretno dogovorimo o isporuci oružja. Gde i kada? Vama to možda izgleda jednostavno, ali nije. <coughs> ne vole Nemci te igre ispod žita, tako da moramo biti sasvim diskretni. The partisans employed exactly the same tactics, um, uh, because in their area, of course, they had the Ustasha forces. Um, 
and when it suited them, they ignored them or made accommodations with them or infiltrated them uh, because that was just as useful um, from the partisan point of view as the Nedic forces were from the Mihailovic point of view. World War II Yugoslavia witnesses the greatest number of different armies and factions. Serbia alone has 12. One of them is the pre-war Chetnik organization led by Kosta Milovanovic Pechanac, who held the title of Vojvoda, a Serbian military leader from the Balkan Wars and World War I. Pechanac decides to join Nedic in recognizing German authority. Mihailovic clashes with his forces, but also uses them to legalize some of his units and procure weapons in 1942. <laughs> tih četnika, dakle vladinih ili nacionalnih, onih četnika koji su u službi okupatora, dalo mogućnost Mihajlovića i organizaciji da preživi nemački napad decembra 1941. godine i da se deo njegovih snaga, kako se kaže, legalizuje kroz ove snage. Ali to je bilo samo tokom zime 1942. godine. Radio Beograd priredio je po prvi put u okviru srpske emisije jedan javan koncert na terazijama u Beogradu. Svira nemačka vojna muzika. The hit song of World War II, Lili Marlene, is launched by Radio Belgrade, played on a rare vinyl record, brought by a German officer. General Erwin Rommel, commander of the Africa Corps, telegraphs Belgrade, requesting the song be played more often. It becomes the signature song of his unit, but something else coming from Serbia will bear upon the Africa Corps. It was the, the railway line through Serbia that was supplying reinforcements uh, to Thessalonica, to Rommel in North Africa. And this was of great concern to the British. 1,500 miles away in North Africa. The battle at El Alamein is entering a critical stage. Rommel's Africa Corps is now facing General Bernard Montgomery and the British 8th Army. They wanted to give them an explanation of what is going to go to Africa, what are the soldiers, what are the troops, what are the weapons. My colleague Alexander Dinčić found the German explanation. izveštaj grupe Vineke, koja je pratila diverzansku grupu Gordon, četničko, odnosno jugoslovenske vojske. Prema tom nemačkom izveštaju, grupa Gordon je izvela 1499 uspešnih diverzija i sabotaža tokom 42. i prvoj polovini 43. godine. Metoda je bio da se sipa pesak u ulje kojim se podmazaju osovine točkova na vagonima. Posle izveštog vremena ti točkovi se toliko usijaju da se počnu da tope. Germans organize exhibits starting in the summer of 1942, ridiculing Mihailovic's actions. Adolf Hitler sends Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer of the elite SS Corps, and the Minister of the Interior to Yugoslavia. Himmler arrives in Kraljevo on October 15, 1942, to inaugurate the SS Prince Egan Division, whose first mission is to attack Mihailovic's troops located on Kopaonik, the tallest mountain in Serbia. As head of the Gestapo, the German state security, Himmler oversees the mass arrests of Mihailovic's agents who have infiltrated with Nedic and Pechanac.
Gestapo's codename for Mihailovich's secret army is DM organization. Unfortunately, many of these people wound up in camps and being deported to Mauthausen as a result of being perceived as infiltrators and spies. Porodica Draža Mihailovic was bila uhapšena. Kogod je bio od oficira dokazan u neku ruku po kriterijuma Gestapoa da je recimo bio u nekoj značajnoj funkciji Draža Mihailović, on je bio strejan. Ukoliko bi ih otkrili da su pripadnici jednog ili drugog pokreta, utoliko su pre stradali. I Mihailovićevi ljudi i komunisti. Jer većina pohapšenih u Beogradu su bili DM organizacija. Ne zato što je DM organizacija u Jugoslaviji bila mnogo veća nego što je organizacija partizanska, nego iz prostog glasoga što Beograd nije bio centar partizanske aktivnosti, dok je Beograd bio zvrlo važan punkt organizacije Draža Mihajlović. Despite arresting thousands of DM operatives, the Gestapo cannot catch the man responsible for supplying key intelligence to Mihajlović via a secret radio transmitter located in Belgrade. In the early 1970s, a Yugoslav television series on the war showed acts of sabotage, but only those of partisan agents who had infiltrated the native ranks. Any specific actions by Mihailovic operatives were credited to the partisans. Specifically, in one episode called The Radio Station, the writers relied on the Gestapo files on Jarko Todorovic. Kapetan Todorovic. The U.S. government sponsored war propaganda films made by Hollywood. They supported all allies, including Yugoslavia, with Mihailovic as a focal point. Comic books offered stories of the general and his brave men to the American public, describing him as the Yugoslav MacArthur. One such comic shows him in a triumvirate, alongside Admiral Bulkley, the torpedo boat hero of the Pacific, and baseball star Lou Gehrig. Perhaps the most interesting is the participation of Orson Welles as voice actor and Vincent Price as narrator in a radio program called Chetniks, sponsored by the Department of Defense. Welles is coming off the success of Citizen Kane and his radio drama War of the Worlds. You are now, each of you, a member of the Chetniks. There is no life for you now but implacable war on the Nazis. As far as the United States was concerned, I think we had a very romantic view, if you will, of Mihailovic. He became a hero of European resistance. And, you know, it cheered people up, it made people feel that there was uh, you know, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. In that sense, there was also propaganda about heroism, about the war fighting, about the Yugoslavs who in the what his activities were exaggerated, but that helped because at the time good news was such a premium and people like Churchill enthused about it. For his efforts in fighting the Axis, Time magazine nominates Mihailovic for Man of the Year in 1942. 
And so both Mihailovic and the Yugoslav government appealed to uh, the BBC and to other media um, to tone down this, uh, this tremendous uh, amount of uh, publicity. I think I said in the book, you know, the last thing a secret army needs is a worldwide advertising campaign. The movie Chetniks, The Fighting Gorillas, starring Philip Dorn as Mihailovic, was produced in 1943 by the 20th Century Fox Studios here in Los Angeles. It was the culmination of propaganda. The movie premiered in Chicago in April of 1943, and Mayor Edward Kelly proclaimed that day Chetnik Day in honor of Mihailovic. At the same time, the British had their movie called Chetnik being produced at the Ealing Studios in London. However, at the moment of all this glorification, one of Mihailovic's allies decides to accuse him of collaboration. The Soviet Union actually offered the Yugoslav government in exile to send in a mission with a Soviet officer to join Mihailovic, uh, which the Yugoslav government was quite enthusiastic about. It. However, the British were not very keen on the idea of a Soviet agent being dropped into Mihailovic for a number of reasons, predominantly probably because the British felt it was their show. They wanted to be in charge and they didn't want the Soviet Union interfering with it. Um, in much the same ways later on, they were not terribly keen on the Americans interfering in Yugoslavia. Anticipating a political divide with the Western allies, the Soviets continue to support Tito as their ideological protege, but abandon their ally Mihailovic and decide to treat his infiltration tactics as collaboration. <laughs> All right, let's stop. Let's stop the film. After the war, two blockbuster movies filmed in Yugoslavia, starring Orson Welles and Richard Burton, played a major role in shaping public opinion. However, these movies were also hiding one of the biggest secrets in communist Yugoslavia. Tito's deal with the Germans. And when they are schön eingekesselt sind, then greifen wir gleichzeitig von allen Seiten an. Orson Welles plays a Chetnik again, this time as a collaborator who offers the Germans a deal at Neretva River. In reality, it is the partisans who offer the Germans a deal, in anticipation of an Allied landing. An Allied invasion was. Tito's greatest fear, because if an Allied invasion happened, then it would give the opportunity for Mihailovic, who had far more forces than he had, to become prominent. The partisans are chased down to Neretva by the Germans in Operation Weiss, meaning white, intended to destroy them. Once Tito learns that the British are drawing up plans for an invasion together with Mihailovic, he decides to send a delegation to the Germans. Three of their top leaders actually went and met up with German officials and actually went to Zagreb to, to, and, and were allowed to, to visit girlfriends and go to the cinema and to visit their families. Gilas, Popovich and Velebit were involved in the March negotiations and negotiated with Germans at increasingly high levels. A truce was agreed where they would not fight the Germans. Um, this suited the Germans because it freed them up. They could then turn on Mihailovic's forces and wipe them out. At one stage, uh, it seems that the partisans even suggested to the Germans that if there was an Allied landing, they might join forces with them. That may be a bit of um, PR on behalf of the partisans to make their negotiations more successful. At Neretva, the British still have no contact with Tito, who is getting dangerously close to the Germans. However, he will soon get British support at Suchiska, a battle depicted in the second movie, starring Richard Burton as Tito. Hitler naregioje svojim generalima von Leru i Litersu novu ofanzivu koti partizanskih snaga. Odmah opkoliti uništiti partizanske udarni jedinice i njihovu bođu Tita. Tako je počela po angažovanosti ljudi i ratnih sredstava operacija najvećih razmera nazvana Švarc. Tokom planiranja operacije Švarc u tom prvom planu, u čijem diktiranju učitvoju i lično Adolf Hitler, partizani nisu spomenuti. 
Plan se odnosi samo na uništenje četnika. The Germans were planning Operation Svats against the Chetniks. Every possible effort was being made to ensure the Italians did not know of Operation Svats. They simply did not trust them not to tell their allies certain Chetnik units. The secret covered up by Tito after the war is that Operation Schwartz, or Black, was initially planned against Mihailovic. How did an operation to capture Draja turn into the biggest battle between the Germans and partisans? Kada su Nemci 17. maja produžili svoj napad i na partizane, pošto su oni umeđu vremenu upali u Četsku teritoriju. Kad su već upali u tu teritoriju, Nemci su odlučili da uniste jedne i druge, a i inače, stalno je iz Berlina dolazilo upozorenje da se sa bandama ne pregovara, već da se one uništavaju. E toga dana je prema Đilasu Broz izjavio tako nam i treba kada verujemo Nemcima. Na početku operacije Švarc, Mihailović je izbjegao nemački obruč, to od strane njihove najbolje jedinice Prvijebrske divizije, samo za dva sata. Kod Đalovića, Klanca, kod Brodareva, povukao se dakle na sever. Dva sata posle njegovog povačenja, obruč je bio potpuno zatvoren. Tu se vidi koliko je Dražo Mihailović bio ovako imao koncepcije koje su za Gerilu značajne bile. Oni nisu uhvatili skoro nikoga. Oni nisu uspjeli da okruže i unište ni jednu jedinicu Jugoslovenske vojske. Međutim, u njihovom obruču se našla glavnina snaga partizanskog pokreta koji su uspavani pregovorima koji su pre toga vodili sa Nemcima, verovali da do te operacije neće doći. Njihove glavne snage se dolazi iz Grčke, to je prva brska divizija, 25.000 vojnika, najbolja formacija Nemačka koja je bila ovde, ona je, recimo, osvojila kao kaz od crvene armije, i to je 7. SS, Brtska divizija Princi Eugen, koja je dolazila iz Hercegovine. Tako, kada je 17. maja 1943. godine počeo taj napad Nemaca i na partizane u operaciji Svarc, oni su uporno pokušavali da se probiju na jug i uporno su najlazili na najjače Nemačke snage i masakrirani su. The partizans are hit with the largest German offensive to date in the Balkans. He has lighted a fire which will burn with a... Winston Churchill delegates a special assignment to Captain William Deacon, his confidant and assistant in writing the history of England. He arrives with the first British mission to Tito. Deacon arrived right in the middle of this encirclement. Partisans escaped very, very narrowly. Mr. Churchill planned a wonderful trip for us. Particularly for you, his personal friend. Yes. Tito was wounded, I think, and also Deakin was wounded. I think they may even have been wounded by the same shell. Uh, so you can imagine, you're a young man arriving in the middle of a huge and terrifying battle on Mount Dermitor. Um, it left a very strong impression on Deakin. That you're going to associate yourself with the people. You form friendships. It's natural. It's a normal human behaviour. Um, he didn't meet Chetniks, he didn't meet Mihailovic. The small part of the unit, with the leadership of the Josip Broz and the part of the Vrhovnog Štaba, was able to get out of it. With a strong fight, with a young man, they were on Balinovc, they were able to get out of it. But they were able to get out of it. The majority of the unit, the majority of the central unit, the majority of the wounded unit, the majority of the unit, in the German reports, there are about 5,700 wounds and about 4,000 wounds. So they were very dangerous wounds, completely unprecedented against the wounds of the German and engaged forces under their command, who had about 500 wounds in this operation. The British military military missions are the pressure of the unbelievable fight of the partisans, because they are in the epicenter of these fights, and their reports Utiču da u stvari dođe do te prve drastične promjene kod Britanaca koji kažu pa da u Jugoslaviji se ne bore četničke snage Mihajlovića nego upravo partizani i to upravo s Nemcima i to u situaciji kada se naša vojna misija tamo nalazi i sama takođe trpi gubitke. Vladimir Velebit, who reached an agreement with the Germans several months earlier, convinces Deakin that Mihajlović is a German collaborator. It's rather ironic that it was actually Velebit who had been one of Tito's negotiators, um, parleying with the Germans uh, during the March negotiations.
Operation Swartz didn't destroy Mihailovich, but it did damage him in the eyes of the British, who now take note of the partisan guerrilla activity. In 1941 and 1942, they advised Mihailovich to lay low. Now they want him to take overt action. The Intelligence Center, located in Bletchley Park outside of London, houses a supercomputer, which is able to decrypt the German secret code Enigma. This gives the British a better picture of activity on various front lines, including Yugoslavia. Reports from Bletchley Park add weight to Deakin's dispatches from Suchiska. He initially started out advising all the time that the support for Mihailovic should be maintained. And he did this throughout 1942, and he did this during the beginning of 1943. But you can clearly see from his reports that were going up to the chiefs of staff uh, through the various channels uh, that his opinion changed. Pa jedino se od Mihailovića od Srba tražilo da napadaju Nemce neprestano, tražilo se od drugih, ali su oni odbijali s obzirom na čvrstinu okupacijskog režima. Mihailoviću se to pripisivalo is there. Churchill, in, in, in particular, didn't appreciate the reprisals. Whereas when it came to the French Marquis being in the forests and being threatened with reprisals, and Churchill would tell them to go easy. And there was this, this, what people would refer to as British double standards. The British wanted to be in the driving seat, and Mihailovic, uh, not unsurprisingly in his own country, <laughs> also, wanted, also felt he should be in control of the situation. Was free. Liberated after 21 in September of 1943, Italy capitulates. The British Army's plan, prepared with Mihailovic to invade in Yugoslavia, was shelved. The Allies continue their push from North Africa into Italy. Mihailovic launches a large-scale offensive now that the Italian troops in Yugoslavia have surrendered. Recently discovered documents from the Bundes archive show that the offensive's ultimate goal was Sarajevo, held by the Germans and the independent state of Croatia forces, the Ustashi. In spite of the now tense relations with the British, SOE paratroopers, commanded by Brigadier Armstrong, the new head of the British mission to Mihailovic, participate in the offensive, fighting alongside Chetniks. Kao vojvoda rudničkog korpusa, na primjer, ja sam tu moju zastavu nosio do Goražbe i kad je to sve popadalo, ostalo u krvi, na primjer, i onda jedan mi je, moje trojke, trojka je pratila moju zastavu, dvojica su mi je ostali živje, jedan mi je poginuo, zastava mi je sva bila kao šito izbušena, kad je najveća borba biva. A ja, pored stroja, viče hrabro, braćo za kralja i jutarnju. I nikad ne prežalja, ne mogu braću. Ne mogu da je prežali. I onda vidim ostado, izgibe to sve ostao krvi. Drina već postaje krvala, nije više ona... Unfortunately, the BBC uh, broadcast uh, a report of all this action that had been taken and the Visegrad Bridge being blown up and so forth and attributed it all to the partisans. Um, to say that Mihailovic's forces were disappointed would be an understatement. The BBC had a, had a fairly crucial role in, in the whole business of information or disinformation. Dalje od Višegrada sa jedinicama jugoslovenske vojske nisu išli savjetnički oficiri. Dokumente jugoslovenske vojske su ili negde sklonjene ili su uništene, a 
a saveznička ne postoji iz prostog razloga što nije bio njenog saveznika, tamo Nemačka niko nije donao u vojni arhiv u Beogradu. Dokumenta koja govore o jeseni 43. godine su vrlo značajna. Značajne su zbog toga što govore o najvećoj antiosovinskoj operaciji koja je provedena na tu kraljevine Jugoslavije. Kompletne osovinske formacije polače se dalje prema Sarajevu i prave novu, pa kad su postanju linije odbrane, u pravcu Sokolac, Mokro Pale. Umeđu vremenu Nemci dovode pojačanja, čak iz Albanije dovode, da je već drugi motorizovani puk, to im je bila interventna jedinica za Balkan. Jugoslovenska vojska počinje artiljerijsku pripremu, gađući Sokolac, a odlučujući napad bio je zakazan za... a 22. oktober 1943. godine u ranim jutarnjim časovima. Dva časa pre toga. Jedinici Jugoslovenske vojske i sa leva i sa desna svim raspoloživim, svim pokretnim snagama koje su imali napadaju komunisti. Znači drugi udarni korpus sa juga, treći udarni korpus sa severa. Sve to zanimljivo. Zanimljivo je što su Nemci videli za komunističke jedinice kreću prema položajima jedinica generala Mihilovića. Ali oni su smatrali da one tamo idu kako bi zajedno sa jedinicama generala Mihilovića napale njih, Nemce. Zašto su Nemci tako mislili? Zašto su bili najemni? Zato što su videli da i kod jednih i kod drugih postoje engleske vojne misije. I oni su bili ubeđeni da su one engleske vojne misije kod formacije komunističke partije i one engleske vojne misije kod jugoslovenske vojske uspele da izglade stvar, da sve staje pod jednu komandu i da njih zajedno napadu. Kada su 22. oktobru zoru Ustaši javile da partizani sa leđa napadaju Jugoslovensku vojsku i da je front Jugoslovenske vojske slomljen, da je napad na Ustaše prestao, Nemci nisu verovali. Dva dana Nemci nisu poverovali da su partizani zapravo svim svojim snagama udarili u leđa Četnicima. A to je bilo... I don't think anyone reading this material could come to anything other than the conclusion that uh, it was the partisans who were providing most of the resistance to the Germans, and that's why I have no doubt whatsoever that Churchill took the decision to support the partisans. I don't think that he, on the basis of those facts, had made his decision. But they only served to make the decision to justify the truth. American President Woodrow Wilson was the greatest advocate of the creation of Yugoslavia at the end of World War I. My grandfather, Milorad Drashkovic, was the signatory of the Declaration for the Creation of Yugoslavia and a minister in the first government. Conceived as an ideal state which will unify all southern Slavs, Yugoslavia proved to be costly in World War II. The policy of killing and expulsion of Serbian civilians in the independent state of Croatia weighs heavily on Mihailović, who has to uphold his constitutional oath and defend Yugoslavia while protecting Serbian interests. A small Serbian village is Yugoslavia's last chance. Because the Germans occupied Belgrade, this school in the village of Ba at the foot of Ravna Gora became the national parliament of Yugoslavia. At the invitation of General Mihailović, deputies from 12 political parties which made up the pre-war parliament of Yugoslavia gathered here, including the pre-war president of the parliament who chaired the session. They arrived in secrecy, avoiding the Gestapo on the way. When it was over, all of them lent support to Mihailović's defense of Yugoslavia. Oni su govorili da treba Srbija da bude od Djevđelije do srpskih Moravica. Bili su ekstremni nacionalisti, dok smo mi bili za demokratiju i istovremeno smo bili da se održi Jugoslavija, da se kažne svi oni koji su 
koji su učinili zločine, ali da se održi Jugoslavija kao država. There were still suggestions all the time that perhaps there could be spheres of influence where the Chetniks would have their sphere of influence there and the partisan and they, they would just steer clear of each other. Uh, but by the end of 1943, Churchill took the decision, the decision, no, it's not going to work. The future of Yugoslavia is being decided, not inside the country, but in Tehran by the Allies. Tehran also signals the first glimpse of the post-war order. Roosevelt is looking at a direct deal with Stalin, focusing on Western Europe. The British want to keep their influence in the Mediterranean and Eastern Europe. Britanska politika davala ton i dinamiku prema Balkanu, a da su Amerikanci samo to sledili. The Americans realize the Soviet army is gaining on the Germans in the east. Roosevelt is ready to cede Eastern Europe to Stalin. The British and the Soviets will both back Tito, who is agreeable to their interests and strategy, unlike Mihailovic. However, one American is cautious about the new British reports coming from Yugoslavia. The head of the Office of Strategic Services, General Bill Donovan, sends the first American mission to Mihailovic, headed by Lieutenant Colonel Seitz, and Captain Mansfield. The American mission is formally under British Brigadier Armstrong. And Armstrong, undoubtedly acting upon orders that he had been given, held uh, Sykes and Mansfield to a very close leash. He didn't allow them much freedom of action. They soon wearied of that, deciding they weren't being of much use there, and decided that they would make a tour of their own, which they did through a sizable area in Serbia. Mihailovic appoints Captain Borislav Todorovic, his liaison officer with Allied missions, to take the Americans on a walkabout tour. They traveled everywhere to see how many men were there that were fighting for Mihailovic. Who were they? Because they didn't, couldn't see it with their own two eyes. In late 1943, U.S. Captain Walter Mansfield spent months with General Mihailovic and his staff writing down his observations for his report. Here are just a few of his excerpts. There is complete distrust of the British by Mihailovic and his leaders, who feel the British have sold them down the river to Stalin. Another excerpt. I saw no collaboration between Chetniks and Germans in Serbia. And finally, a third one. The Serbian people are tremendously enthusiastic for Americans they refer to Americans as the only nation which has no ultimate designs on them. The British had decided that they were going to drop Mihailovic, abandon him. Donovan resisted that. He did not favor doing that. And when he stated his objections to that, he attached a copy of Mansfield's report to his objection to, in effect, support the idea that we should not uh, abandon Mihailovic or uh, withdraw the missions from Serbia. Mihailovic wanted Bora to go to Roosevelt and ask for help. Ahead of us are much bigger fights. We and our allies will go into them as we went into Sicily, together. And we shall carry on, together. After submitting their reports to Donovan, Seitz, Mansfield, and Todorovic are presented with a gift from President Roosevelt. It was about that time when the Four Freedoms had been printed which I had the original, in Serbian. Roosevelt had done it in Serbian. And he personally gave this four freedoms to be given to, to Mihailovic. The four freedoms were painted by the American artist Norman Rockwell and published in a special edition of the Saturday Evening Post. They symbolize freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, 
and freedom from fear. But while he gifts Draja with art, Roosevelt sends weapons to Tito using American plane station in Italy. In spite of Donovan's favorable view of Mihailovic, Roosevelt follows Churchill's lead on Yugoslavia. Admiral Bulkley, who once graced the same comic book cover with Draja, is sent to help the partisans, who are now on the Adriatic coast. He is accompanied by the great American director John Ford. In Ford's authorized biography, Bulkley testifies as to American split loyalties, quote, Ford was anti-communist and supported Tito's rival Mihailovic. Tito was a full-blown commie. Mihailovic was the good guy, unquote. One of the most outspoken officers from OSS who went into the partisan side and who was very openly pro-partisan was uh, the movie actor Sterling Hayden. In his initial report, very flattering about the partisan movement, even he came to view later, and he said that the idea that there is liberated territory in Yugoslavia by the partisans is, in his words, pure bunkum. That's his phrase. Not a military phrase, but that's his phrase. So the idea that Tito is the liberator of Yugoslavia, I think, flies in the face of the evidence that is there. Bogart, glad to be back. Well, well, you both did a swell job. Right. Oh, you, Mr. Bogart. Nice now, give us a lot of good news, sir. How are our boys doing? Our boys are doing a great job. On our trip overseas, my wife and I saw thousands of American boys in Africa and Italy, and you can be awfully proud of them. But as the Allies are getting ready to leave Mihailovic, it turns out they need him more than ever. American planes that bomb Hitler's last remaining oil fields in Romania are shot down by German air defenses over Serbia on their way back to Italy. Mihailovic is the only one who can rescue them. And the briefing officer explained all the details about the, the mission and the altitude we would bomb out at and so on and so forth. Then he made an interesting comment. And he said, if you have to bail out over Yugoslavia, stay away from the Chetniks and seek out the partisans because the Chetniks are collaborating with the Germans. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. What do you want me to do with them, said Mihailovic. What do you want me to do with them? And that's when Bora made the contact with the Americans, that we had the American airmen there. Uh, so that was, you know, that's really, we knew that first. I knew that first. <laughs> Gospoda Yevremova number five. This is where my family lived in Belgrade. In 1944, my father left here to go to Ravna Gora to join with Mihailovic. And he was there during the rescue of the airmen. Years later in the US, he met the man responsible for that rescue, George Vujinovic. This was the last interview he ever gave. chef <laughs> It was just uh, uh, so well planned by uh, George Vunovic. He was the architect of this great escape. When the English were saddled, they said to Churchill that they could not go to Vunovic and go to Draje. I was told that the general was by mid-1944, Hundreds of U.S. airmen are gathered by Mihailovic's commanders from across Yugoslavia and dispatched to his headquarters near Ravna Gora for the airlift. The operation, codenamed Halyard, was classified until recently. Halyard is significant for another reason. The Americans had a camera crew filming the operation. It is the only footage of Mihailovic shot during the war.
archivist Bonnie Rowan discovered the footage at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., 70 years after it was filmed. At NARA, I work with paper records, I work with photographs, but mostly I work with motion pictures. And when there was nothing that I could find in motion pictures, I went to the paper records. And the paper records are very strong in talking about the various people who worked with Mihailovic, the, what he was accomplishing, various reports from the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, and so up to a point, they were very, very positive. And, and now we found the film. As the Americans are arriving, the last representative of the British mission leaves Mihailovich's headquarters. It was a very meticulous combing through of many um, different film reels um, before we actually uncovered these particular shots. Films give uh, visual evidence of American Special Forces interaction with Mihailovich and some of his crews during the Operation Halyard. A 10-year-old boy comes running up yelling, Nemsi, Nemsi, which meant Germans. So the, the Chetnik that was with me handed me a homemade hand grenade. <laughs> I, was, I don't know whether I was more frightened of the hand grenade or the Germans. And we went up into the hills, and two minutes later, the Germans came by, two truckloads. They were the most the kindest people that you could ever want to meet. You know, they, they greeted us with open arms, contrary to what we were told when we uh, went to briefing. <laughs> In spite of support from political parties in the country and from the government in exile, Mihailović receives a blow from which Serbia and Yugoslavia never recover. On September 6, 1944, the general and his Chetniks wait for the annual King's birthday speech broadcast on BBC. But the king does not speak that day, a sign that something is wrong. He makes the speech six days later, but the subject matter is anything but celebratory. Under pressure from Churchill, the now 21-year-old King Peter publicly disavows General Mihailovic and throws his support behind Tito. The British were fearful that Donovan was going to take advantage of the air crew rescue unit being in there to send in another mission. And of course, that's exactly what he was planning to do. And he did it in a way to keep it secret from the British or anyone else for that matter. Donovan conceives of Operation Halyard as a cover for Operation Ranger. The two operations overlap. This is why Colonel Robert McDowell can be seen in the footage featuring the rescue of the airmen. However, he is there for an entirely different reason. The Germans still held communication routes in major towns in Serbia, but they know they are fighting a losing war. McDowell tried to negotiate 
that the Germans would actually surrender to Mihailovich. And he had a meeting with Mihailovich. Um, I actually met someone who was present at that meeting. And the suggestion seemed to be that if Mihailovich and his forces could actually reach Banja Luka and establish a power base there, that the Americans would be prepared to recognize them as an alternative government to Tito's Avnoi. The American Ranger mission, headed by Colonel McDowell, offers the Germans to end the war in southern Europe. The entire German Balkan army is to surrender to Mihailovich and the American special forces. They had plans of using um, the Chetnik headquarters as a home base to send units into Eastern European countries. To govori o tome da je Mihailović što aktivno, što pasivno kontrolisao ipak veći deo teritorije Srbije. Donovan receives orders from President Roosevelt to withdraw McDowell from Yugoslavia. Roosevelt assures Churchill this will happen shortly, but McDowell decides to extend his stay. And McDowell and his people make a wide survey of the area. They, they go into different parts of the country. And what they find is that the partisans are overwhelmingly turning their supplies and their energy toward the nationalists, the Chetniks, not the Germans. Tito tries to reach Serbia and meet the advancing Red Army. But the Soviets are first met by Mihailovic's men on the Danube. Njegove snage su od septembra do negde novembra delovale zajedno sa sovjetskim snagama na svim tačkama gde su došli u dodir. Znači od sovjetskog prelaska Dunava negde u septembru pa do borbi u zahvatu Pomoravlja i gradova kakvi su Deligrad, Aleksinac, Kruševac, Čačak. Mihailovic's troops liberate Kruševac on October 14, 1944. The Soviet envoy, Major Prunyan, and the American envoy, Lieutenant Kramer, greet the Chetniks alongside cheering crowds. Ali se u nekoliko slučajeva to savezništvo uz prisustvo partizana koje takođe se pojavljaju na tom terenu već u sledećim danima, u stvari menja u jedno neprijateljstvo. Tako da, pored zajedničkih borbi oko nekih gradova, sovjetske snage već posle nekoliko dana te iste snage razoružavaju i predaju partizanima koje u nekoliko slučaja odmah vrše streljanje tih ljudi. postoje jasne analize koje pokazuju da bi pokret otpora bio mnogo efikasniji da je vođen pod jedinstvenom komandom, da je bio koordinisan sa ostalim snagama antifašističke koalicije i da je iskoristio prave trenutke za otpor. I on je da bi izbjegao sukob sa sovjetcima koje je smatrao i dalje svojim saveznicima odlučio da se povuče u Bosnu. On December 27, 1944, the last group of Americans are airlifted with Mihailovic's help. They plead with the general that he board the plane as well, but he refuses, saying, it is my duty to stay with my people until the end. Američka praktičnost da dođu do cilja najjednostavnijim putem i na najkraći mogući način, stvari, pobedila sve ostale strategije koje su predlagali Britanci, a koje su uglavnom imali kontekst možda čak i prvog svjetskog rata, znači dejstvo iz Mediterana nekako u 
u središte Evrope. Amerikanci su procenili da je to najefikasnije ako se učini od severa Francuske direktno u srce Trećeg rajha. In June of 1946, Tito organizes a mock trial of Mihailovic in Belgrade, where everything seems to be turned on its head. The prosecutor claims partisans were the first to attack the Germans, not the Chetniks at Loznica. The indictment is framed around Mihailovic's two meetings with the Germans. In 1941, he met with them to stop the reprisals. Following the meeting, the Germans launched an offensive against him. In 1944, he met the Germans to accept their offer to surrender. However, the prosecution portrays these meetings as proof that he was a collaborator from the beginning to the end of the war. Infiltration with Natish forces and Chetnik agreements with Italians, which were encouraged by the SOE, are labeled collaboration. Mihailovic's Yugoslav army officers the only ones who did not surrender the Germans in 1941 are proclaimed German collaborators. To je Draža Mihajlović. Bio je osniva četničkog pokreta pod prividnom tezom da okuplja snage protiv okupatora. A kada je komunistička partija Jugoslavije pozvala narod na ustanak, on je stupio u saradnju sa nemačkim i italijanskim okupatorima. The Cold War is starting, and the trial witnesses unexpected bizarre moments. The Western allies, which helped install Tito a year earlier, are now being targeted by the prosecution. McDowell and the heads of the British missions, Hudson, Bailey, and Armstrong, are accused of being too close to Mihailovic during the war and of conspiring with him against the communist revolution. All three heads of the British mission, who argued with Mihailovic over strategy and inactivity, offered to testify on his behalf in Belgrade, but are denied. Bailey refuted allegations of collaboration against Mihailovic by saying it makes no more sense uh, to say that Mihailovic's forces infiltrating Nedic is an indication of collaboration with the Germans than to say that we are collaborating with Hitler because we have spies in Germany. Over a hundred witnesses are called by the defense, but the judge only allows two witnesses to testify. Two women come to the defense of General Mihailovic. The film of Mihailovic's trial is the first theatrically distributed Yugoslav production after the war. It will play a key role in the creation of a new ideology, providing the blueprint for numerous World War II movies filmed during Tito's rule. Nearly all of them show partisans as heroes and Chetniks as collaborators and war criminals. While Mihailovic was on trial in Belgrade, he was praised in New York City. American journalist Dorothy Thompson organized a commission for a fair trial of General Mihailovic, which held a week-long series of hearings examining evidence in Mihailovic's favor. The New York County Lawyers Association opened its doors to have the hearings held here from May 13th to 18th of 1946. Those hearings were chaired by Arthur Garfield Hayes. Hayes was a founding member of the New York County Lawyers Association and also was famous for defending the Scopes, Scottsboro, and Reichstag trials. Hayes' association with Thompson and her popularity raised the public profile of the hearings. Thompson, the leading journalist of her era, was the first foreign correspondent expelled from Germany by Hitler. 
Katherine Hepburn portrayed her in the movie Woman of the Year. The Commission of Inquiry, organized by Thompson and presided over by Hayes, is made up of judges, attorneys, United States senators, and congressmen. We protested in front of the Yugoslav embassy. Uh, we uh, sent uh, letters to the Yugoslav embassy saying we wanted to testify on behalf of Mihaljevich, and we were denied. More than 20 airmen and officers testified in person, and more than 300 affidavits were submitted in evidence, all asserting that General Mihaljevich was an ally. General Mihaljevich was awarded medals by Generals de Gaulle and Sikorsky, for his struggle on behalf of the Allies. At the recommendation of General Eisenhower, President Harry Truman posthumously awarded Mihailovich the Legion of Merit Medal for contributions to Allied victory. It is the highest award an American president can bestow on a foreigner. The award was immediately classified. It would be interesting to know what Mihaljevic's thoughts were uh, at the end. You have here an individual who, in 1941, when England had no allies on the continent, threw in his lot uh, with Britain. And to believe that he then, in 1943 and 44, when the war was clearly being won by the Allies and lost by the Germans, would then throw his lot in with the Germans is inexplicable. And that makes no sense. Deco moja sad vam se predstavlja kralja Petra, vojnik, rudnički vojvoda, goškog cara, draže generala, koji kroz svoj život oplakuje tužnu majku Srbiju, svetlu krunu Karadžođevića. Goškog cara, dražu generala i svoju ljubljenu zastavu, co je nisam s kraljem Petrom na Oplencu razbio. Nikada, ni sa jednim nepetem, nisam zaključio nikakav sporaz. Bifor svetski odnao je mene i moj rad. In his final statement, General Mihailovic's voice was calm and resolute. He spoke for over an hour. The courtroom, which was usually hostile, sat in complete silence, listening to his every word. When he was done, he walked back to his chair and waited for the verdict. Guilty. Death by firing squad. A few days later, he was buried at an undisclosed site. Mihailovic's Yugoslavia was sold to Stalin. Draja had to disappear. Nobody needs heroes when the war is over. They're expendable. But some, the very few, are never forgotten.
S obzirom da možemo ujaviti danas našu odluku, pozivam sve prisutne da ustanu. Nakon većenja i glasanja, ovo je studirano rešenje. Ustava se zate za rehabilitaciju Dragoljiva Mihajlovića Draže, pa se utvrđuje da je odluka Vrhovnog suda Federativne Narodne Republike i Vlasave, Vojnog veća, 1 sud, broj 1, kroz 46. od 15. jula i 1946. godine, u delu koji se odnosi na Dragoljiva Mihajlovića, Miškava, od trenutka i jednog donošenja, i da su Miškave sve njene pravne potrebice, uključujući i kažne popiskacije imovine, a rehabilitovane lice Dragoljiva Mihajlović Draža smatra se neosuđivanim. Hvala.